Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Aparna from IIT Bombay and today we are going to talk on module Transit and the Shape of Indian Cities from Paper Sociology of Urban Transformation. And after completing this module, you should be able to understand how, how we are going to highlight the link between, between transport and land use. The objective of, of, of this module is to situate issues of motorization against data on trips undertaken in Indian cities. Uh, on uh, next level, we'll be examining the political economy of transit policy. And in the context of public transport, options such as metro rail, bus rapid transit and intermediate public transport. So we'll be looking all these issues in this module. India's urban transport system is as problem ridden as it is diverse. Poor quality and congested roads combined by fast growing automobile populations. In weak traffic control, high rates of accident mortality, especially for pedestrians, inadequate public transport system, and the unacceptably high levels of noise, air pollution, and environmental consequences associated with uh, Indian roads. And anyone who has been stuck in a traffic jam would conquer with this uh, diagnosis of the ills of Indian cities. And yet, what explains the inability of urban planners to anticipate and provide for the transit needs of the city residents? What social, economic and political factors underpin these poor outcomes of transport planning processes? We'll be examining these questions in this module. We'll be also looking at what urban transport in India is characterized by the priority on privatized and motorized transit the political economy of transport has favored large-scale transport infrastructure projects over low-cost transit system non-motorized modes of transit have been highly regulated land use and transport how transit shapes the city policymakers interest in transport infrastructure stems from their well-established primacy in creating and sustaining agglomeration economies and helping expand market size. In this perspective, transportation is an input to all urban activities. I quote, transport and land use have symbiotic relationships, quote unquote, Mohanti. The key implication of this acknowledgement is the co-determination of trip and location decisions as part of the land use transport feedback cycle. This feedback cycle rests on the spatial separation between land uses in a region, for example. Some areas have a clustering of residences, which may be separate from the shopping areas, educational and institutional areas, commercial districts, state and government offices, and so on. These geographical distances necessitate trips that use the transport system, whether through walking, driving, or taking a bus. While this part of the feedback cycle is amply intuitive, planners further also recognize that transport infrastructure is not evenly distributed. Some areas are better connected through vehicular or railway networks than others. And moreover, transport linkages along certain routes are stronger on other routes. The fact that not all localities within the city can access other locations with equal ease has profound implications for land use. For example, if residents slums or bastis on a city's peripheries face a paucity of affordable transport options to travel to the city center for work, either jobs will have to be generated in the vicinity of the slum area or residential possibilities for low-income citizens will have to be created closer to the location of jobs. As Mohanti has argued, these connections help to make a strong case for integrated transport land use planning and more to the idea of transit-oriented development. For our purposes, it is important to ask how do these logics unfold in the Indian city? In a paper in the Economic and Political Weekly's Review of Urban Affairs, Dinesh Mohan provides a broad brush sketch of the evolution of the typical Indian city 
and its effects on transport network demand. Unlike European cities, which have a single business district on which all traffic converges, Indian cities have grown to encompass multiple business districts. This was partly the consequence of colonial planning practices which situated the European quarters, civil lines, cantonments, government buildings at a distance from the existing native city. This separation introduced a fundamental divergence in the trajectories of the European and the Indian city. With stark socio-spatial segmentation in basic services and municipal investment in favor of the former. Post-independence, these patterns continued to persist even after Indian elites came to occupy the British city. The post-colonial city thus grew outside the boundaries of both native and British cities. In the new millennium, these trends have been accentuated by the increasing self-segregation of the middle classes and elites in gated communities on the peri-urban frontier. The transport networks resulting from these spatial configurations have been brought out. The transport networks resulting from these spatial configurations have been wrought by two paradoxical forces. On the one hand, the urban form has encouraged sprawl and densely inhabited mixed-use development around multiple nuclei. This favors low-income and low-skilled residents who need not travel far to find work. On the other hand, the spatially concentrated nature of demand for skilled workers has created a constituency for long-distance travel in the city. One that is exhibited by the rise of peri-urban gated communities. As an example, consider the Mumbai Financial District which is located in the south of the city, even though its professional workforce may commute from areas to the north or east like Navi Mumbai or Pawai. The demand for such long-distance modes of transport is further buttressed by the resettlement of slum residents from the city centre on urban peripheries. This then is the backdrop against which urban transport networks are planned and implemented. As we show below, the default mode in the Indian city has favoured increasing motorization with its paraphernalia of highways, expressways and flyovers. And in recent times, pedestrian overpaths or skywalks. In contrast to such privatised transport networks, public transport systems like metro rail or bus rapid transport offer a different array of pulses, plus and minuses beyond the choice of private or public transport solutions, however, lies the deeper question of the urban accessibility pathway made possible by the spatial structure or actively sought by long-range integrated transport planning. Road et al. defines such pathways by, quote, the degree to which accessibility is based on the physical proximity between origins and destination or on transport solutions which can overcome spatial separation and the degree to which these solutions involve private or public motorized transport, quote unquote. Transit in the Indian city. Urban accessibility pathways ideally incorporate both land use and transport infrastructure planning. Mohan laments the inadequacy of the evidentiary database in India, which limits informed policy choices. The next section presents the available data on transit metrics in Indian cities and outlines why increasing motorization is problematic in the context of Indian cities. In Hyderabad, the construction of an elevated metro system through a public-private partnership with Mathias, an infrastructure from promoted by the Information Technology Service from Satyam was prioritized over additions to the existing rail network as well as proposal to build a new BRT system. Amid the eventual collapse of the original private partner, the city became the site of a particularly spirited debate about the monetary and non 
monetized cost of the project. At stake were the projected awards. At stake were the projected effects on heritage buildings by the operation of an elevated metro system as well as the environmental and noise impacts, especially at multiple points where the route steered close to the schools, colleges and hospitals. In the very heart of the controversy was the issue of the real estate which occurred to the private partner as part of the PPP because expansion of rules was partially made possible by the acquisition of monetization of surrounding lands. Indeed, the Hyderabad case led some activists and researchers to contend that the memory of world-class transport that pervaded the policy discourse on the metro system was closely linked with the inequitable real estate development. These underlying dynamics propelled its popularity among policymakers. Transit in the Indian city. Urban accessibility pathways ideally incorporate both land use and transport infrastructure planning. Mohan laments the inadequacy of the evidentiary database in India which limits informed policy choices. The section presents the available data on transit metrics in Indian cities and outlines why increasing motorization is problematic in the context of Indian cities. When we look at transit in the Indian city, there are some important points which should be highlighted. First is, the highest percentage of trips by car is undertaken in Delhi at 18% with cities such as Jaipur, Hyderabad and Bangalore at 10, between 10 to 11 percent. In the remaining six cities, according to these estimates, trips by car account far less uh, than a tenth of all trips made. In contrast, motorized two-wheelers account for a high of 28 percent of trips made in Madurai and over 20 percent in Bhopal, Kanpur and Jaipur. Their share ranges between 10 to 20 percent in all other cities except Mumbai, where it is a measly 4 percent of trips. Motorization must be understood beyond mere numbers or growth in car ownership. Uh, it is in, instead a process that facilitates the emergence of socio political constituencies that demand wider roads, cheaper fuels, and free parking allots. Impacts of motorization are also reflected in the skewing of planning priorities in favor of automobiles and against public and non-motorized transport. Motorization policy and implementation An about commitment to sustainable transport became a centerpiece of the National Urban Transport Policy and UTP in 2006. The transition from roads for vehicles to streets for people has failed to translate into transport sector investment priorities. In a study of post-liberalization Mumbai at the turn of the millennium, Anand describes some of the mechanisms through which such exclusion is made possible. And one such mechanism was pedestrian fencing, which closed off traffic medians and footpaths to pedestrian traffic. Instead, pedestrians in Mumbai, as in other Indian metropolises were required to traverse long distance for pedestrian subways. Moreover, these world-class roads often removed street vendors and pavement dwellers. So the data entry of trucks, unlicensed buses and auto rickshaws were barred. A patchwork of street restrictions impeded handcrafts and bicycles. Now we'll talk about metro rail and struggles for space. Mohan argues that cities lacking concentrated business districts achieve less passenger volumes and does not justify huge outlays in metro project. In fast growing Indian cities with multiple business districts, fixed line high capacity rail system do not generate adequate passenger demand and thus they compete with extremely low cost op options such as motorized two wheelers. In the case of Delhi Metro Railway Corporation DMRC, coalitions of politicians, property owners, planners, business groups and others were successful in shaping decision making on selection of consultants and contractors 
among other matters. Uh, in fashion that prioritized group interest and built political capital. The DMRC also became a major player in the real estate market, both as a property developer in its own right as well as through its effects on pricing in local property markets. In Delhi, the metro fundamentally transformed the urban fabric of the neighborhoods through which it ran and in poorer localities and slums, land appropriations and displacements destroyed existing communities to make way for new high-end retail complexes. Bus Rapid Transport Relative to metro rail systems, bus rapid transport systems offer many gains on economic efficiency, accessibility, security and environmental fronts. For every kilometer of construction, elevated metro systems cost 1500 million rupees and underground metro rail cost to between 2000 to 2500 million rupees. For that length, the cost of the BRT is only between 50 to 100 million rupees, orders of magnitude smaller. The bus rapid transport systems are also less disruptive of existing spatial patterns and in fact serve spur the local retail economy. Most importantly, they are better suited to the polynucleated city structure, existing comprehensive road network and its socio-economic diversity of users that characterized Indian metropolises and provide low-cost flexibility in response to changing demand in quantity, quality and location of services. Despite the pros, however, BRTs has not enjoyed the policy popularity of metro rail systems. What explains this rather puzzling gap? Delhi's experience offers some clues, however. In spite of a long period of planning and station, the BRTs had a rocky trajectory in Delhi. An early innovator in public transport, almost from its very start, a 5.6 km stretch of BRT corridor in South Delhi, consisting of two central lanes reserved for bus operations as well as pedestrian and bike lanes and bus stops, was besieged by a powerful car lobby and its media allies. This was despite the overwhelming 80% and more of surveyed bus commuters and cyclists who were satisfied with the corridor and supported the extension. In the year 2012, in response to a public interest litigation, the corridor was shut down for several months and finally reopened after the High Court of Delhi retreated the positive benefit-cost ratio of the BRTs. Nonetheless, the newly inaugurated government of the Aam Admi Party decided in 2015 to scrap the corridor. Comparing bus rapid transport system in Delhi and Ahmedabad, Rizvi argues that the success of Ahmedabad system and the failure of Delhi reflected different levels of political backing. Tiwari hints at the larger political economy of urban transport in India when she suggests that public transport agenda finds policy support only to the extent that it does not inconvenience car owners. Intermediate Public Transport Scholars have outlined the role of local and informal transport services like shared auto rickshaws, maxi cab, minibuses as modes of intermediate public transport system, providing high frequency shuttle service on a few high demand corridors. These modes are especially important in smaller cities of under 1 million where they comprise 13% of all trips. However, these modes have also become part of a dualized public transport system with the IPT operating outside formal transit policy and planning processes. While city buses often see auto rickshaws and other IPT as competition, the two modes of transport in fact play very different roles within the urban transport ecosystem. For example, auto rickshaws and four-wheelers are far more demand responsive than regularly scheduled city corporation buses and more efficient in point-to-point -point connectivity. An efficient and well-integrated urban transport regime 
must include such IPT. Nonetheless, auto rickshaws and more recently, battery rickshaws continue to be seen as traffic hazards and subjected to high regulatory burdens. Focusing on the cycle rickshaw in Kolkata and Delhi respectively, Samantha and Bhaviska argue that contemporary imaginaries of the world-class city show little interest in accommodating such non-motorized forms of transport on the road. Sood also extends this logic further to show how the regulatory framework at the level of the municipal government in Delhi discourages informal transit services provider such as cycle rickshaws drivers to harassment and punitive fines imposed by policy and municipal authorities. Such malign neglect imperils the contributions of a key form of paratransit, especially one that has filled in the gap in last mile connectivity from public transport hub or metro station to doorstep of home vis-a-vis -vis the Delhi metro. More importantly, it also damages the livelihood of a predominantly migrant, unskilled and highly vulnerable workforce. So let's uh, now summarize what we have learned in this module till now. In Indian cities, transport infrastructures have on one hand become a critical component of city-centric economic growth strategies. On other hand, transport infrastructures development often favors motorized transport dependence. Even though paratransit and non-motorized transport find explicit recognition in national policies such as the National Urban Transport Policy and UTP at the local level. The design and implementation of transport regulations continue to be swayed by this powerful automobile lobby. Moreover, even the choice of public transport projects reveals a clear bias in favor of large-scale projects that allow real estate gains, often for the elite groups. Thank you so much.